Hello, this is Dr. Anthony Liberatore of Millican University, and I'll be taking you through uh, three short lectures on how markets and prices operate and building the supply and demand model for economics. In this first lecture, we're going to look at markets and buyer behavior. Well, a market is any place where buyers and sellers come together. And here I have an example of a shoe store. On the supply side, we have a chain of actors involved in supplying the product. Uh, companies that are making the raw materials, the, the rubber and the canvas and the other components of the shoes, the companies that are assembling those or putting those together, uh, the wholesalers, the retailers. So there's a long chain of supply. Uh, but eventually these get into the retailer and buyers or potential buyers can come together with the sellers and make an exchange. So markets are where exchange takes place and any place where there's exchange we have a market and we can analyze the functioning of these markets and the forces within them. So let's take a first kind of generalized view market behavior. First of all, if this is a shoe store, you can think of yourself maybe as the owner uh, and you're selling shoes every week and uh, new supplies are coming in. Well, in this first situation, I'm depicting that there are 500 pairs flowing in, but a thousand pairs flowing out. Well, obviously you would like this as, as the store owner because uh, it's a chance to make more money, but your inventories are dwindling and you have to bring this back into balance. You don't want an empty store. Uh, so there are several things you can do. Uh, you may be able to order more shoes, but that may take time. Or you can raise prices, which would discourage your consumers from buying as many pairs. And uh, this would adjust your inventories. Let's suppose that we have the opposite situation and we have a thousand pairs flowing in per week but only 500 flowing out. In this case, your inventories are building up. Uh, and that's costly for you because you have to buy the shoes but you're not, not getting the revenue to pay for it. So this would encourage you as a store owner to either cut your orders or raise your prices. In other words, the flows into and out of the market are going to affect inventory and are going to affect business decisions. If the markets are free to adjust, decisions will continually adjust, prices will adjust, and eventually the market will bring into balance the flows in and out of the market. In other words, here I have 750 pairs per week flowing in and 750 pairs per week flowing out. We would say that the market is cleared. What is coming in is going out, and there's no reason then for uh, prices to change. They're at a state of rest. In economics, we call that an equilibrium, meaning that the flows are in balance and there's really no force at play to change the price. So here's the general kind of notion of the forces in a market. Now let's look at this in a little more detail. Let's look at the flows out per week. Let's look at buyers and how buyers behave. I'd like to look at your behavior, for example, and have you think about how you behave. So I'm just going to represent a person here with a fixed budget. We all have a fixed budget. So today, when you freeze time, everyone has a fixed budget. We have only a certain amount of income. Uh, what we do, then, is simulate how prices would affect our buying behavior. All right, so I'd like you to think about buying hamburgers. Just assume that you buy hamburgers and your budget is fixed where it is today and I'm going to start raising the price of hamburgers okay but not change anything else you still only have a limited income so this is not yesterday today and tomorrow this is just a simulation of all the given conditions being held constant today except for the price well at a low price you may want say five hamburgers uh, that is a number of them per week because the price is relatively low and you can fit it into your budget. So say five flow out to use a consumer or out to buyers. But as I start raising the price for hamburgers, your behavior is going to change. You're going to cut back how many units you want per week, how many hamburgers you're willing to, to, to buy. Now, if I raise the price all the way to 10, I, 
I would bet that most of you who've dropped out of the market certainly are not going to buy very many hamburgers because you don't have the room for it in your budget. That is, you're going to shift your budget around and buy other things. Uh, you'll go buy hot dogs or ham sandwiches or salads, whatever you'd like to buy. But because this is getting relatively high priced in your budget, you start ch changing your behavior and your consumption. So at a high price, the flow out to buyers tends to decrease. So we here have the typical behavior of a buyer. That is, as prices rise, buyers buy fewer units. They demand fewer units because their budgets are fixed. And this happens in every product and every consumer. And so the blue line here represents the demand curve for a product. And we say that this represents the law of demand. That is, it's a law because it always happens. You, know, you drop an apple, it hits the ground. Gravity is a law. It happens all the time and it's not violated. And this is the case in consumption. So a simple way of thinking of that is the fact that we're simulating how prices would act on you as a consumer when your income is fixed. So here is the representation of our consumer where we have only two factors that we're looking at prices on the vertical and the number of hamburgers on the horizontal. So we have a model with two variables, prices and quantity. Everything else is held constant, mm -hmm. including time. It's per unit of time. So now let's see what happens with the conditions. In other words, we have a condition uh, here of increasing your income. But suppose, I, just think about it for a second, and I have the power to give you $10,000 a week to spend for the rest of your life. Would you change your consumption habits? Well, the answer obviously is yes. And you tend to buy more of lots of things when your income goes up. But as I change your income and increase it, you, the old you no, really no longer exists. The new conditions make a new buyer and we can depict that new buyer in our model so let's look at depicting that new buyer so in this case the old you is gone a new you is here with a higher budget okay so I just played with the idea so that we can really focus in on the fact that the model allows us to categorize and analyze almost any factor that would influence a buyer right? well in this case I've increased income I've basically redesigned the buyer by giving them more purchasing power and now I want to see how they're going to behave. Well obviously this consumer also has a, a fixed budget at any given point in time. It just happens to be a bigger budget. So this consumer is still going to be subject to the law of demand. Here for example they may buy more hamburgers because they have more income. But if I keep raising the price, you eventually will begin to reduce your purchases of hamburgers. So in this case, uh, you can see that your, the consumer is wanting more at every given price, but it's still subject to the law of demand. So the original buyer, D1, demand 1, really no longer exists. That person has been uh, changed permanently because I've given you $10,000 a week to spend. Nice. Uh, and we can replace that picture here with the picture of the new buyer at D2 which is out to the right in our diagram. That is more units are wanted at every given price. So here we have a total shift in demand conditions. We still have a demand curve, but a change in the fundamental demand conditions. These conditions of more income we're representing by more quantity. That is, the demand curve is moving to the right, more for more demand. So now we're able to categorize not only the two variables in the model, price and quantity, but any other influence as a shift or a change in the buyers and a shift in the demand curve.
So let's summarize that behavior. Here I have a simple graph. I have price on the vertical and quantity on the horizontal. And I don't have it numbered. I just want to explain the, the chart or the map. So uh, prices start at 0 and they get higher. So P2 is higher than P1. Over here on the bottom, uh, I've got Q1 and Q2. But it's going from 0 to many. So Q2 is less than Q1. So as we move to the right on the horizontal, that's more, more quantity. So this variable we're going to display is price in dollar terms on the vertical and we're going to display the quantity, the number of units per time or what we call quantity in economics uh, as the flow into and out of markets. Right? So horizontal axis is the quantity, the flow into and out of markets. And the vertical axis is the dollar price. Right, now we can display any buyer or set of buyers subject to their fixed income, ceteris paribus assumption, and represent that as a upward sloping demand curve. Mm -hmm. The other factors that would influence the consumer are hidden, and I have them here at the, the top of the slide. Uh, things such as income, as we just played with, your preferences, your likes or dislikes, the price of other goods, that you might buy, uh, and other factors that you can think of and, and just reason through and see how to change the map of consumer behavior. All right. So this is the typical situation. At a price of P2, the demand curve gives us a map. So I go over from P2 and down to Q2. So at a, a high price, there's a low flow out of the market to you to the buyers. The buyers want uh, a quantity designated as Q sub 2, so low flow out of the market. However, if the price is lower or the quantity is higher, so I started with Q1 because we can map either from Q to P or P to Q, right? so just so we can see that the line is simply the, the map for us, we could read that. So at a low price of P1, we would have a larger flow out of the markets to buyers, so the, the price is affecting behavior. Again, as the uh, price rises for the good, the quantity, the number of hamburgers or the number of pairs of shoes or anything else that you want in your fixed budget declines. And in economics we say that this is a decrease in the quantity demanded by buyers. It's the Q. It's a decrease in the flow demanded by buyers. And so it's a little shorthand here. Uh, the language we use is that as prices rise, the quantity demanded falls, or that there's a decrease in quantity demanded. Now what this is depicting is that as prices rise, you're moving along the demand curve. That is your behavior over your budget. As the price rises, you're reallocating or remixing your budget and the spending within it, uh, and you're going to buy less of any given product as the price goes up uh, in order to get the most out of your given income. So now we can see that we have a map. The map of demand depicts a consumer subject to the law of demand. That is, as prices rise, the quantity demanded moves to the left, that's less quantity. But let's change the circumstances on a customer as we do with hamburgers. Uh, let's add income to this consumer. So we have an initial consumer. We have the display variable on the vertical, which is price, and the display variable on the horizontal, which is quantity, or number of units per time. It's the flow into and out of the market. So here it would be the flow out to consumers. And we're going to denote this consumer with D1, so demand 1. But again, suppose I could give you more income. Well, obviously, I give you that 10000 a week. It's going to affect behavior. And to depict that, we're going to move the demand curve to the right. That is, there's more demand with more income. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we'd say 
that there's uh, a shift in the demand curve to the right. Uh, and in economics, we like to use the term increase, that there's more demand in the market and increase in demand. The thing is, uh, when I say increase, I we normally think up and down, increase up and decrease down. But here in our price and quantity map, uh, the demand curve is shifting to the right. We could also display that as a shift up, but uh, you can see this. A right means more demand. So we can call that an increase in demand. But as your income goes up, the old behavior pattern no longer exists. So I just say that consumer no longer exists. So in any given diagram, we really only have uh, one curve. But we leave the blue curve on most of the time uh, because we're looking at the beginning situation and the ending situation. And you have to get used to that. But essentially now there's only one consumer or one set of consumers here in this particular market. Okay. Well, that, suppose I took income away from you. You had less income. Well, you just don't have the income to spend, so you, you cut back on things. Your, your demand shifts to the left. That's less demand. So the demand curve shifts to the left. We see, say in economics, that's a decrease in demand. Now again, uh, there is only one condition existing for this particular consumer or customer or this market of uh, entire market of customers. So we really don't have three separate depictions, just one. However, in, when we're diagramming it, uh, we'll leave those on the paper just to see where we were. All right, so this is the change in circumstances. And in this case, you notice we're calling this an increase or decrease in demand. It's a shift in the demand curve. We're not talking about quantity demand because that was that's the flow in and out of the market and the movement along the curve. So we have specific language here. All right, let's say language. When prices are adjusting and your budget is fixed, and we're only varying price but nothing else, there's a demand curve. And this represents how you're going to behave with a fixed budget and changing prices. So s suppose prices fall. Well, as things get less expensive for you in your budget, you tend to want more of them. That is, the quantity demanded. The quantity, remember, is the flow. The flow demanded at that particular length of time will grow. And this is the law of demand. Prices fall, quantity demanded expands. Mm -hmm. Price and quantity move in opposite directions. Down price, increase in quantity. Got it? And so the demand curve here represents consumer ceteris paribus, subject to changing prices with the fixed budget. Great. But we can look at any multitude of influences on the buyer and also depict that in the same diagram. And so af after we understand here that the prices are affecting the flows in and out of the market, let's look at some changes in buyer's circumstances. Again, we have hidden factors. And any of these things can change. Uh, but in, if I increase income, or let's say you have uh, increasing desire for, for a particular good, uh, and your preferences are changing, like you really want it, that would be displayed in our two-variable model as a movement in the space. The behavior pattern shifts to the right. That's a change in demand, an increase in quantity, um, excuse me, an increase in demand. The demand curve shifts to the right. That's more demand or an increase in demand. Mm -hmm. This replaces the existing relationship of the consumer because now you have different characteristics. Again, we can go the other way and say you have less income. So your behavior pattern is going to be to the left, less quantity with that less income. So the demand curve shifts to the left. This we would say 
uh, is a decrease in demand. Well, great. Now we have the basically the two sets of forces, prices and all the hidden factors, and we can describe buyer behavior in any of these circumstances. And this should be fairly straightforward for you in your head. I think you can do this uh, pretty quickly and maintain this conception as we go through to see it in your head. Uh, so let's let's play with it a little bit. Here I've got the demand for Coca-Cola. Well, I don't know exactly the shape of the demand curve. You know, it could be curvy or it could be really steep or it could be flat. And there's lots of behavior, but really now we're just interested in the mechanics of it. Uh, so we have a downward sloping demand curve, right? And we have the consumer here with the fixed budget. As prices rise for Coca-Cola, consumers will want less of it. And this is the law of demand. It works that way because your income is limited and as you're raising the price, you're readjusting or reallocating the mix of things you're consuming in your budget. And as the prices rise, the flow out of the market to consumers begins to shrink. All right. The language we have here is that as the price rises, the quantity demanded declines. Well, that's the typical behavior for Coca-Cola. And even though you may have a habit forming like for Coca-Cola, I know eventually this relationship will hold true. And I can do that with you right now as we did with hamburgers. Let's suppose everything is frozen, including your budget, and I have the power to raise the price of Coca-Cola. One dollar a bottle, two dollars a bottle, three dollars, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Well, I know if you're playing along with me, you're dropping out of the market. This is you you don't have enough income to support that kind of consumption, so your quantity demanded declines as prices rise. But as you're as you're cutting back on Coke and you're reallocating or remixing your budget, what are you doing? Are you still drinking cola? The answer is yes. And so you're going to look for substitutes, something else. So because the price Coke is going up, and it could be going up rapidly and at a phenomenal high price, you're going to look for alternatives, such as Pepsi. So let's assume we have a Pepsi customer here, and that customer has given circumstances, ceteris paribus. Uh, so how does the price of Coke affect the buyer side in the market for Pepsi? Well, we haven't said anything about the change in the price of Pepsi, correct? So that's not a movement or a reshuffling of the budget. Because hmm? price and quantity would be the two variables that lay out our map for us, and a change in price would be a movement along this curve. But that's not what happened. The price of Coke went up, and you wanted less Coke. But in the Pepsi market now, this Pepsi and Coke are substitutes. They're related to one another. And so the higher price of Coke is going to change a fundamental condition or a hidden factor in the Pepsi model and push you to want more Pepsi-Cola. Yeah, it may not be a lot because you're just so loyal to Coke. But here we can depict, depict that influence be, between these two goods that is happening through price on the buyer by shifting the buyer to the right. The buyer wants more Pepsi, so there's an increase in the demand for Pepsi. And of course, the original consumer doesn't exist anymore, just the, the, the new consumer wanting more Pepsi as they switch from Coca-Cola to Pepsi. Again, that's a remixing in the budget. We described that as less quantity demanded as the price at Coca-Cola goes up, but an increase in the demand for Pepsi. So get it? Quantity refers to the movement along the curve. That is, the price and quantity pairs, where a shift in the demand curve is called a decrease or an increase in the demand curve, uh, rather than the change in the quantities. So it's a fundamental shift in the market. All right, so here's the influence of prices, and these two goods obviously are substitutes. So they're connected in the market to consumers' desires and influenced by the relative price of the products. I want to say relative price. That's um, 
you know, they both, both might be 50 cents, and one might be 75, and the other one would be 50, but the markets will clear, and you get some kind of equilibrium, and then you change them, and the relationship changes, and this is how consumers behave. So we can describe consumer behavior either as a movement along the curve for a particular good in response to price, or a shift in the curve for any other influence other than price. Let's look at some cases here. So let's start at the on the left side and say the prices of smartphones fall. How would you fill this diagram in? Now come on, fill it in. You'd have to put in the initial price and quantity. And see the reaction with quantity. So here I've got a decline in price. I'd have to read from my demand curve, my map, how, what this translates into quantity. But a price of P1, I want Q1. When the price falls to P2, I want more quantity, Q2. Mm -hmm. So this is pretty easy. We're talking about price. You know, that's you move the price along the vertical axis, and we're moving along the curve. So the quantity demanded increases. Price falls, quantity demanded increases. And buyers are remixing their budget. Now let's look at gasoline. Uh, the, if the price of gasoline goes up, you're going to change behavior. I know some students will say, no, well, I have to have it, so I'm not going to change my behavior. But you are. Uh, just accept it. It's a uh, reality that we are affected by price. So in this case, I made it a little steeper to suggest that as the prices increase, there's uh, lesser decline in the quantity be, um, be, because it is hard to, s to substitute or switch in the short run. But as the price of gasoline rises, obviously, uh, you want less of it. So you, you, dem you have decrease in quantity demanded. Here, the flow out of the market shrinks. Right. So gasoline and smartphones, and we've both we've experienced both of these situations, and now we know how to describe it in, in economics. And if I say that the price here at the bottom of gasoline rises, you would tell me that the quantity demanded decreases, and that's what you're telling me. I can see it in my eye, mind's eye as a movement along the curve. So we can communicate because we have a language that is constant. It refers to how demanders behave. Uh, up in the right hand corner I have the apps for smartphones. I mean you get a smartphone and you need apps. So sharp increase in smartphone sales. How does that affect uh, the app market? The iPhone or Android phone market for apps? Well the price of phones declines, uh, and consumers want more smartphone units, Q1 to Q2. Well, you're going to need more apps. Yeah. So here we would say that the new consumer can be depicted a in moving to the right in the, the diagram showing an increase in the demand for apps. Okay, We didn't talk anything about the price of those things, but we know that demand for apps is increasing. Down the bottom I have uh, the beef market and the, there's a mad cow's disease. Well that got, will f affect both sides of the market because the mad cow's disease is hurting the supply of beef, but it's also affecting the demand. And for this case I like to look at the demand to begin with. Okay, so let's say you hear that it's mad cow disease. Do you want more or less beef? Well, uh, you probably want less beef. So there'd be a less demand for beef. The new consumers to the left, less demand. So it would be depicted as D2. Consumer no longer exists. So now we have a discussion of supply and demand 
in markets and have looked into a little bit of detail on the demand side of the market showing how buyers behave. Next we're going to look at the supply side of the market and the production and um, supply of products into the market. Okay, I'll see you at the next lecture. Thank you.